It is no secret that I love my vegetable garden, but it would not be anywhere near as productive without the help of pollinators. And we as gardeners need to help the pollinators by planting beautiful flowers and natives to attract these butterflies, bees, and hundreds of thousands of other species. So let's head out to North Carolina where Meg is gonna show us how to do exactly that. Have you ever excitedly taken out your harvest basket to your garden because your zucchini that you planted was really taking off only to come back empty handed because you found out that that said zucchini just shriveled up and fell off? Yeah, me too. I thought there was gotta be something wrong with the plant. I gave up immediately. I said gardening is too hard and I dubbed myself as having a black thumb because I didn't know how important it really was. And that's what happens to fruiting crops when they don't get pollinated. They shrivel up, they fall off, no fruit comes. We've gotta attract them to our garden. We've gotta provide an environment that they're gonna love or else why would they wanna come and hang out? We've gotta make our gardens like the hottest new booked out restaurant in town that you can't get a reservation at unless you're someone important. So how do we make these garden VIPs wanna make reservations at our restaurant and come back again and again? First, we've gotta find some prime real estate for our restaurant or our pollinator patch. And whether you wanna create a separate pollinator patch like this one that I have behind me here, it doesn't look like much now, but it is winter time. Or you want to interplant some pollinator plants with your vegetable garden, like intermingled amongst your veggies. It just needs a sunny spot, somewhere with about six to eight hours of sun per day. I have a few different pollinator patches throughout my entire garden and I'm actually expanding this year and creating a couple more pollinator patches but I highly highly recommend planting one if you can in front of your kitchen window like this one that I have back here it's just really fun to be looking out of your kitchen window or any kind of window that you are regularly looking out of in your house and just seeing all the beautiful butterflies and hummingbirds visit your garden so I recommend having it somewhere like that but still close to your vegetable garden. Now that we have our perfect spot picked out, it's important that we have a wide and diverse menu. Pollinators feed on the nectar and pollen that flowers produce, and some flowers look a little bit more appetizing to certain pollinators than others. Some pollinators prefer different flower sizes, different structures of the flower, different shapes, different colors, all kinds of things. So it's important to have that wide variety that caters to everyone. So let's create a menu that will book out our gardens for the entire season. For the first course, we have native perennials. The first course is the most important because it's giving that good first impression and native perennials do just that. They're perennials, so they come back year after year. They are low fuss, they're easy to maintain, and they grow really well in our native soil because they're native. And most importantly, they're providing lots of food for our very precious native pollinators and native beneficial insects. Native plants are so important because a lot of non-native plants are inedible to our native pollinators or they just don't quite meet their pollination needs. What's considered native to your very specific area is going to very greatly depending on where you live, so you may have to just do a little bit of research, but there's so many different ones you can choose from just depending on where you live. And another perk is they're so, so easy to grow. Because they're native, they're already accustomed to your climate, they're gonna be accustomed to your soil. And if you want control over which varieties you wanna be growing, one of my favorite methods to start their seeds is with the winter sowing method using the jugs. This method gives them that period of cold stratification that they may or may not need depending on where you live. I'm in the Southeast, so a lot of my native species are gonna enjoy that cold stratification. Or if you're like me and you're a little bit lazy or a chaos gardener, you can pick up a seed mix. I really like this mix. This is by American Meadows and it's an all native Southeast mix. It's got a lot of really great wildflower species in here. They're both annual and perennial. So you can get a mix like this and just walk out and wherever you want to establish a pollinator patch, just sprinkle some seeds. Um, it's best to do this in the fall or the winter so that they can get that cold stratification. And then you will have a pollinator patch come the spring. It's really easy. For the main course, we're gonna serve up some plants that attract pollinators, but more importantly, they serve as host plants for some gorgeous, gorgeous butterflies. Host plants are plants that butterflies rely on to reproduce, as it's the only kind of plants that their larval form, or their caterpillars, can eat. The host plant that we most often think of is milkweed, and this is the host plant for the gorgeous, the show-stopping, 
monarch butterfly. And if you've ever thought about raising monarch butterflies, this is your sign. I'm telling you, do it. It's such a fun and rewarding experience. But even if you don't want to raise them, it's really important to plant milkweed in your garden for them because these are migratory butterflies and they're migrating all the way from Canada all the way down to Mexico to overwinter, which is a really long way. I don't, I can't even understand how they do it, but they rely on backyard gardeners like us to plant plenty of milkweed for them so that they can stop along the way and reproduce. And as you may or may not know, their numbers are declining and they are at risk of being endangered or maybe even going extinct one day. So this is one of the most important pollinator plants that you could probably ever plant in your garden. Another gorgeous butterfly to plant for and one that's really easy to raise in your backyard garden if you're interested in raising butterflies are swallowtails. I've raised the Eastern Black Swallowtail for the past three years now and it's just so fun. And they have many different host plants, but the ones that I plant plant for them are my dill and my parsley. And I just make sure that I way, way over plant both of those so that I have enough for myself and my butterflies. Some other gorgeous butterflies to plant for are painted ladies. And one of their host plants that's my, one of my favorites to grow are hollyhocks. They are like the perfect flower for that cottage core vibe, you know? They have these long stalks that are just covered with flowers. And another butterfly is the Gulf Fritillary. And their host plant is actually an edible fruit that we can grow that's also native. And that is the passion flower or passion vine or also called maypop. It's got many different names, but that's an edible fruit that you can grow in your garden, an edible plant for the butterflies. It's a win-win. For dessert, we've got our showy annual flowers. These are flowers that not only catch a pollinator's eye, they catch humans' eyes as well. These are the ones that we grow for our cut gardens, that we decorate our houses with, or that we put together in a bouquet to give to a loved one as a term of endearment. They're beautiful, they're big, they just make you go wow. Since these are mostly annuals and not native plants, I like to grow them in my raised garden bed along with my vegetables, which are also mostly annual and not native plants, by the way. And it, they look really nice there because they're adding a pop of color, they're adding dimension and texture, growing amongst the vegetable garden, and they're also drawing in those pollinators to my vegetables to help me pollinate them. One of the flowers that I grew last year that really, really stuck out was the Tithonia, also known as the Mexican sunflower. And I'm telling you, I have never seen so many butterflies in my garden until I planted this Mexican sunflower. And not only just butterflies, but different species of butterflies. I saw species of butterflies that I had never seen in my garden years prior, and they were always swarmed onto the Mexican sunflower. So I really, really recommend that one. I couldn't recommend it enough, actually. I could probably do a whole video on the Mexican sunflower. With these showy annual flowers, you can either go ahead and start them in seed trays indoors right now and get a head start on their blooming cycle. That way they will bloom earlier for you, or you can wait until after the last frost and you can just direct sow most of them right into the garden. I only briefly mentioned a few of my favorite flowers to grow, but you guys pop down in the comments what your favorite pollinator flowers are to grow and maybe mention where you live so that it can help others out when they are trying to design their pollinator gardens for this year. Lastly, we need to provide some incredible accommodations to keep them hooked and keep them wanting to stay in our garden. And one of the most simple things you can do is wait and leave some of your garden cleanup until spring. When your annual and perennial flowers die back over the winter, don't prune them yet until spring. This provides insects and pollinators with a nice and toasty place to overwinter, and it can provide seeds for a lot of birds. When you do go to prune in the spring, you wanna make sure you're leaving at least 12 to 18 inches of stem left on the plant because stem nesting bees and other insects like to nest inside of the stems, and that way they can reproduce and you'll just have more pollinators in your garden next year. You can also buy or make some of these bee houses. I know that leaf cutter bees really love to 
use these houses. I have a few all around the garden and every spring I see these little leaf cutter bee babies emerge from it and it's just really cool. So a few of these placed around your garden is a great idea as well. Besides shelter, pollinators also need a water source. And one easy and simple thing that you can add is a bird bath. I just emptied this one out to clean it, but bird baths are essential for not only birds, but butterflies and bees. And in the summer, I like to fill this with pebbles so that it creates more of a shallow watering space so that the butterflies and bees can land on the pebbles and just take a little drink. And they really, really appreciate that, especially in the heat of the summer. Once you have all these things in place, you can actually get your garden certified as a national wildlife refuge and a pollinator garden. All you have to do is go online and find a checklist for your county and just follow the checklist, follow all the instructions to get your garden certified. And I'm actually doing that this year and I'm really excited. It's gonna be nice to, you know, just have a certification for all of your hard work. Well, there you have it guys. That is the recipe for a perfect pollinator garden to attract pollinators and beneficial insects to your garden and keep them coming back for more and more. Until next time and Kevin, thank you for having me back.